Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. This week we have Brad Calipari on, and Brad is John Calipari's, the head coach of Kentucky's son. And Brad and I have known each other for a long time because he played uh, in the high school program I coached in in Lexington, Kentucky. So we go way back. Um, we talked about prep schools before he ended up transferring out of that high school to a prep school up in Massachusetts. We talk about that experience and, and the benefits of it. We talk about him playing at Kentucky under his father and all the players he had to guard on a daily basis that are now in the NBA. Uh, he then transferred to Detroit Mercy uh, to get some playing time, and he talks about you know switching levels. And then he went back to Kentucky to be an assistant coach talks about that and now he is an assistant at LIU Brooklyn, Long Island University Brooklyn under coach Rod Strickland who is an NBA all-star and, and one of the all-time, you know, greats and um have a great conversation. It's good talking to him again and um I hope you guys will enjoy it. So without further ado, here's Brad Calipari on the Prep Athletics podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics podcast. This is Corey Heights some battles I'm, I'm i'm not sure if they got us if they did maybe maybe so you will get better as a player during that year so it was kind of exciting like oh yes yeah, somebody wants me brad welcome to the podcast what's happening how you doing i'm doing good it's good to see you again and we go back to our days together at lexington christian academy in yes, Lex, sir. Kentucky, and uh, we had a little relationship there. And then at some point, um, you kind of came to me and said you wanted to look at prep school options. What made you think uh, that prep school was a good idea? Um, well, for me, it was nice to kind of step away from the spotlight at Kentucky. Um, aside from that, at the time, I tore my ACL. So I was out for the whole season there. Um, I wanted to play another season. And obviously reclassifying back would have helped. And I think that was one of the main reasons with all that being said. And then on top of that, you have much better competition in the prep school leagues, especially in the, uh, in the NEPSAC conference. And that was something that was going to prepare me for college at a, at a better level than almost any other high school could. Gotcha. And you ended up choosing McDuffie, but I know you listed or visited a lot of schools before you made that yeah. decision. Ultimately, why did you choose McDuffie? I just, I love the staff and I love the guys they were bringing in. Um, it didn't really matter about the situation, like the living situation, anything like that. It was more about, are these guys good people? Do they know what they're doing? Are they going to get the best out of me? Are they going to bring good people in around? And they did every part of that. And, you know, I still talk to each of those guys probably every month or so. Uh, we stay in contact and, you know, those guys are like family to me now and I wouldn't want to change it if I had a chance to do it over. So I'm glad with the, with the decision I made. And that's so important you say that. And I say it to kids all the time, Brad, to where if money is even across the board, so it's not like a $20,000 difference between schools, the main thing to pick a prep school for is the coach, which you just yeah. mentioned there. And that's because they're going to be the guys yelling at you. You know, you want that yeah. guy yelling at you. They're going to be doing skill development. They're determining your playing time. And ultimately, yep. you know, they're going to be calling college coaches on your behalf. So that relationship is very, very important. So exactly. Yep. I'm, gl I'm glad to hear you say that. How did McDuffie specifically prepare you for playing at the D1 level? Um, with a lot of that. So like NEPSAC has rules that are closer to college than most high schools. You know, you played, I think it was 18 or 20 minute halves. And then you had 30 second shot clock at the time. Um, in Lexington or in Kentucky period, you don't have shot clocks. Um, so that's something that kind of forces you to play with a little higher pace. Um, you're also playing against other kids in prep schools. And, you know, we played against kids that are now in the NBA. There are a couple on my team that were in the NBA and the G League now. So you also have the competition, the size, the skill, the pace of game um, that is all way different than normal high school levels. Yeah, and the big thing about Kentucky high school players is they got a high basketball IQ, right? And we've seen right. that throughout the years of the Kentucky players that we've placed in prep school that have done great things there. How do you compare the NEPSEC IQ to maybe Kentucky high school basketball IQ? Uh, well, you got to think most of those kids, they're very skilled. You have more 
that have a high IQ and then you have others that are very talented, very skilled that, you know, freak athletes, good size that have to learn the game. So you have a little bit of both. You have your guys that are more skilled that know the game that maybe aren't as athletic. You have your elite of the few that high IQ, high motor, high, great athlete, you know, and then you have others that are, you know, raw talent that are still learning the game. And, you know, like back to you said, it's about the coach and the environment that you're in. They're going to teach you and basically mold you and get you ready for the next level. Yeah, absolutely. Now you went from McDuffie to Kentucky and obviously your dad coaches there at the time. You grew up there um, since he's been a coach. What was the best part about playing at UK? The best part for me was probably being able to go against top 10 lottery picks every day in practice, you know, that helped me really prepare for going to Detroit after because I worked harder than, you know, damn near everybody. But at the same time, I had to work harder than everybody just to be able to maintain with those guys, not even, you know, surpass them because you know, I'm not the, the athlete. I don't have the size that these guys have. And, you know, that's something that at that level, you know, the guys are great athletes, great size, and they have high skill. And, you know, I just had to be able to, go with those guys and that really helped me get better overall and then stepping down a level that helped me be able to produce at that level and what do you think since you're around all these lottery picks on a daily basis is a lot of it god-given talent or is it god-given talent i'm sorry god-given like um athletic prowess like are you just born with speed like darren fox or is that something you can nurture or do you have to train on top of that because the reason i'm asking this everyone wants to play in the nba right so right. I'm always trying to find like what a kid can do or just some prescription which doesn't exist but i'm right. just trying to hack it a little bit so what did you see from your vantage point that either they had naturally or they did on their own that got them to that nba level so a lot of those guys like some of the athleticism you can't really teach there are some things that you can you know you may be able to get a little more a little more quickness with terms of footwork and technique on certain things um size I mean you can't teach size and length like that's something that's different but the thing that separates those guys that have the size the length the athleticism they all work very hard and that's the thing they have talented they're very talented coming in but on top of that they know they have this desperation that I have to make it and that drives them and they work very very hard to add to the height the skill the you know whatever they have the athleticism and that's why guys that come through UK, they really separate themselves and you have lottery picks, number one picks, first round, whatever it is. And, you know, most, most of the guys, they stick in the league and they make a difference, you know? Yeah. Your dad having that experience coaching in the NBA, like what's one tidbit that you can share with us that he would tell them that only his experience in the NBA could provide them. Like, did he have a certain mindset where he coached a certain way? Like, Hey, you're going to have to do this. If you want to play at the next level. Well, was there anything um, specific? Sorry, my dogs are trying to jump up here. Um, <laughs> no, not not too much. It's more so of how you carry yourself and your preparation. Um, professional athletes, obviously, they prepare way different than a normal college athlete would because this is their life. Um, at UK, you really teach guys how to prepare the right way and really take care of their bodies. Um, watch film what you look for how you prepare for the games and practice how do practices look days before games or two days before games or on game day um and really getting them into that routine on you know we're going to carry ourselves like professional athletes and you basically you learn the lifestyle a lot of the guys they they know to work hard um i mean you have your handful of guys that you know need to learn to work hard when they come in because they are very gifted and they mm -hmm. think you know I may be able to just walk right in and be okay and that's not always the case but for the most part it's just really learning how to treat yourself and you know others around you like professional athletes yeah that's perfect and you can say hey I've been there I've done that this is what you need to do less than me or not yeah but it's the prescription yeah so that was the best part of playing at UK was with all that talent on a daily basis. What was the most challenging part of being on the team there? Playing with that talent on a daily basis. Right. <laughs> um, you know, like I, 
every day it was, you know, against Hami Diallo, Tyler Hero, you know, Kelvin Johnson, Quade Green. Like, those were guys that I had to go against every day. And, you know, that was difficult. But at the end of the day, like, it got me better. Um, you know, it's it's a good and a bad thing. But those guys, like, they're talented. They're crazy talented. So some days it was hard and others, like, you know, and that that is what it is. But aside from, you know, at the end of, like, those guys are good dudes, but, like, we'll be in practice and going at each other, and that is what it is, but then I have my dad on my back as well, which is, like, sometimes that's a pain, but, you know, I I was I was fine with that. You know, we would butt heads every once in a while, but most of the time we were we were good. We, we kept everything, kept everything solid. Yeah, so that's my next question. What was the best part about playing for your dad? Um you know, just being able to spend time with him and learn from him, you know, he's very knowledgeable and, you know, he was harder on me than a lot of the other guys. And I, you know, I'm glad he was like that because if he wasn't like that, you know, I probably wouldn't have gotten the development I got. Um, and being able to learn the game at that pace and that high of a level, you know, that's something that really benefits you, especially now that I'm in coaching, I've seen it from several different ways and you see it at the highest level you see it mid major you see it at lower level and everything is different and now being able to adapt to where i am and play styles and you know level of talent at select levels you know now you're able to maneuver much more clean and smooth yeah absolutely and the, i guess the biggest challenging part of playing for your dad was playing for my dad playing for your dad yeah cuz cuz there would be times where you know a lot of head coaches and and they know there's so much going on in their head they'll say things or they won't and they think they said it so there was one time he told me to do something and I did it and we were running a player or something and he stopped and he blew the whistle started yelling at me I'm like you told me to do this and he's they shut the f up or get the f out of the gym and I was just like yeah, yeah. I can't really yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, <laughs> just had to take that one on the chin. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, for the most part, it was good. You know, love them. That was a great experience overall. So yeah, no, you get all that one on one time and just to be around them. That's just, that's got to be great. That's gotta yeah, because he 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 never really coached me or anything in high school or middle school. Like never really worked me out. I always worked out with with other guys with Coach Payne with Coach Strickland when he was there. You know those guys. Um, you know he never really did anything like that. So like, it was nice to finally, you know, be able to play for him and learn from him in that sense. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, I work with my father full time in a real estate development business. So we, same thing. We didn't get that in college, high school when I was in the military, right. but now we talk on a daily basis and he helps out with prep athletics too. And it's just a different side that you don't see right. when you're in the household growing up as a kid. So yeah. Yeah. I yeah, see exactly. the advantages. So you decided to transfer out of Kentucky, the most storied program right. in, in the kind of country, to Detroit Mercy. And when you did that, um, was that main reason for playing time and a chance to actually shine on the court more? Yep, yep, exactly okay. that. So what was the biggest difference that you saw? Um, the skill level isn't crazy different. You have a lot of guards that are very skilled, wings that are very skilled. A lot of it is the size and athleticism mm -hmm. along with the skill. You know, that's what really separates guys. You have guards that may be 5'9", 5'10", 6 feet that are doing a lot, you know, get shots off, make shots, score, whatever they want. And then you go up to SEC, you have guards that are 6'3", six, 6'4", six, that do the same thing. Right. And maybe be a little more athletic. And that's just, you know, a lot of that is you're gifted with it. You're blessed with it. You, how you were how you were born you can't really ask for much else but you know a lot of the talent level is still you know high level talent with those with a lot of those guys yeah but did you so your your time though against those guys at Kentucky that probably helped you it probably made everything relative than when you went down to Detroit yeah, no, Mercy so it, it did make a lot of things easier um like for me I was, I was a shooter I make shots that's what mm -hmm. I have to do I had to get used to it, Kentucky, going against guys that are 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, 7 feet, closing out on me. So it made me have to develop a quicker jumper, be more efficient, you know, 
basically be a better shooter all around. I have to be able to shoot out of several different types of footwork. I mean, probably eight, nine, 10 different, whatever it is, however the ball is in my hand, I got to get it off quick and it doesn't matter how my feet are. I had to get used to shooting unorthodox ways. And when you step down a level, guys are a little shorter, whatever, less athletic, it's easier to get shots off. So you must have loved that then. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was what, was, nice. what was your career high at Kentucky and then Detroit Mercies? Uh, Kentucky, probably three or four points. And then <laughs> okay. Detroit, it was, I think, 20 or 22. Who was that against? Toledo. Oh, cool. Yeah, Toledo. Yeah, man. All right, so you leave Detroit Mercy and you go back to Kentucky to be on the coaching staff there. How is that different being on the court as a player and now on the court with a whistle in your mouth? It's it's different, but there's not too much about it that, you know, is really like overwhelming. A lot of the stuff I did last year, I did like a lot of player development stuff with those guys. So I was able to be on the court and teach and really, you know, give guys instruction in that sense. And, you know, during practice, we're all scrambling, getting things done. And having the relationships I had with those kids was nice because, you know, I'm not the same age as them, but I'm young enough to be able to understand and get along with them easier than some of the other guys may be. And when it came to like training, I think that helped me because now I have that relationship with them where they trust they will, you know, take the teaching and the constructive criticism the right way instead of, you know, cop an attitude or, you know, not listening, period. Yeah, absolutely. And after that time, you were now moved recently in the past few months to LAU Brooklyn. So you went from the Bluegrass to now near the Barclays Center, which is yes, a big sir. transition. How's that going for you so yep. far? Um, I love it. Brooklyn has been great. Um, staff has been great we just finished putting together our staff up here all the guys are in um i think we got our four hours a week on the court for in the weight room right now so we've been going 45 minutes to an hour for four or five days a week whatever we have um but you know we're just getting everything situated and getting everything squared away with you know the season coming up so quick turnaround and you know we got to be able to adjust and adapt in a timely manner to say the least yeah. Now, whenever I talk to a coach, a head coach assistant at any level, I always ask, what's your pitch? You know, why should I come to your school and play if you guys offer me? So what's the LIU Brooklyn pitch, Brad? Uh, for us, I mean, we have a lot of guys. We have You have Coach Strickland. You have Coach Brown that came from Vanderbilt. Um, coach Thomas that was with the 905 Raptors. Um, coach Hicks that was at Rice High School. It was a very storied program. Um, I believe he was at St. John's as well as an assistant for a little bit. Um, you have all these guys with so much knowledge and so many connections and so much success at each level um, that, you know, for kids at this age and in these areas, it's very important for them to get that type of development. And each one of these guys is great with skill development. And at this level where you may have guys that are two, three year players you need that development and as a staff collectively along with the development you have great basketball minds period and each one of these guys they really care about kids they love what they do and to be in an environment like that is unique and that's something that you should want to be around um aside from that i mean you're in new york city you know, what, what much else is there? Is there more to say? You know, you got Manhattan's right across the bridge. You have all these all these places to go. Good food, you know, aside from good basketball and being able to get great experiences with us. You know, you have that the city life, the little the getaway if you if you really need it, you know. Absolutely. And you and I talked a few weeks ago about NIL deals and Kentucky. Obviously, uh, a player can go there and get some monster NIL deals which we've seen from the, uh, you know, reigning player of the year, Oscar Shibway. And, right. but it, it hits every level, right? So do you guys, at LIU Brooklyn, what, how, do, how are you guys approaching NIL deals for your players? Um, we don't want it to be the sole reason players come here. Obviously it's going to play a part in getting certain players if need be. Um, 
you want guys to come here because they want to get better at basketball and they want to play for coach Strickland and be a part of a culture that we're going to build. Um, obviously like guys have enough connections to where we may be able to pull in some money and you know, if we are great and if we're not, you still have guys that want to be here. You don't want to bring guys in. They're only here for the money. And then something happens and they leave out on you. Um, and that's something that we talked about. Like this can't be the main reason, you know, kids come in. That's how, you know, things start to implode from the team inside out. And then you just, you fall apart. Um, but you know, what we can get, we're going to get, and you know, the connections we have, we're going to try to make the best of them. But like I said, at the end of the day, you want it to be basketball first and the, the money and all that, that all comes after the fact. So you mentioned something there that's interesting, which I've been predicting for a while now is, you know, things going wrong within a locker room based on NIL deals. Right. You've seen that too. Is that something coaching staffs discuss like behind closed that's doors? That's something that, it, it has to be addressed as a team. Um, you know, you're, at this point, every if guys are getting paid, like you need to be grown about it. You don't speak about how much you make. And at the end of the day, guys are probably going to say, oh, I made this much money. But they have to be understanding like, oh, if this guy's better than me, he's making more money. That's what, it's the name of the game. You know, better players make more money. And you have to be an adult about that and really be mature and, you know, if you're not making as much money, work harder, play better, see if guys reach out to you, see if more money comes in. But if you're not putting the work in and you're looking in the mirror and you know, eh, like, I'm not really doing what I can, you have to be mature about it and understand, you know, this isn't what it is. So I think that's some, it does need to be addressed that, you know, don't talk about what you make, how much you make, what deals you're getting, keep all that stuff. That's all personal. And for kids that young, it's hard and they wouldn't know, which is why it's partly on the staff to address that early. If guys are getting those types of deals. Interesting. Because it's, it doesn't always correlate though to the best player in the team, Brad, like you might bust your butt, but the guy at the end of the bench might be more and creative and have a bigger following. Yeah. And that's the other side of it. Guys have to understand that maybe I'm not as marketable. How can I make myself more marketable? It's an, an easier fix. Maybe now I have to put myself out there a little more. I have to do things I may not want to do as opposed to the guy who isn't playing, but he has a YouTube channel or whatever it is. However, he's making himself more marketable. Talk to him. What do you do? You know, and you have to really find those lines. Like with Oscar, Oscar is very marketable. He's, Everybody loves him. He's, you know, God's child. He's a great kid overall. Has a great personality. He's funny. His smile is contagious. You know, you can't really hate the kid. He's a, he's a great kid. And on top of that, he's a hell of a player. And he yeah. puts up crazy numbers. So you have, with him, you have the best of both where he's going to make a lot of money. And that's just, it is what it is. So when you have those two sides of it, there are going to be people who are more marketable that make more money, people that are more skilled that make more money. Then you have the select few that are very marketable, very skilled. They're going to make the most money, you know? I, I think it's great because like, like Oscar, say he would have gone to the draft last year. might've been late first round, second round. He's going to make more this year, right? Have a chance to win a title, be the big man in the right. state and only get better under your dad's tutelage to potentially, you know, be a mid round pick or, right. or get a long contract. So to me, I, and Drew Timmy coming back. Drew wasn't going to do anything in the draft, but he's a great college player. Right. He'll make bank up there in Spokane. So for the, you know, your one and dones are still going to be out there. But for these college type players that you get to follow now for more than just one year, I think it's going to be, I think the fan base is really going to like it. Right. No, I agree. I agree. All right. So if you're at LIU Brooklyn now and you're looking at two players that are almost clones, all right, let's just say it's the same player and they're clones. One's coming out of a public school. One's coming out of a prep school. Which player are you taking and why? There's probably a right answer to this. School. Probably, why is probably that? the prep school. Why is that? Because I feel like with prep school, especially now, if you go to a prep school that's sport, like structured around sports, you have much more structure within coaching staff, within weight, strength training, with nutrition, with, you know, probably most of them are boarding schools. So they've lived by themselves for a, a, a year or two, whatever it is. 
um, the change wouldn't be too much. They've played against the highest level of talent in other prep schools, most likely. Um, yeah, I think that'd be about it. Unless yeah, I'm missing I, anything. No, you're not. It, it was a, it was an easy answer there because you've lived it and yeah. done it, but yeah. this is not to discount. I'm not here. I know I do prep athletics and I'm just letting everyone know this. Um, you do not need to go to a prep school to play D1 or go to the Ivy League or play at a place like Kentucky. All right. You look at every roster at every school in America. There are plenty. We always of, have public school kids. Oh, plenty of them. So it's not for everybody. So I just want to make that disclaimer. I know I, I, I pour the Kool-Aid. I drink it. But you do not need to do it. All right. So just relax on that. Because a lot of families too, Brad, will come and be like, well, which prep school will help me get in the Ivy League better? Hey, if you're good enough and the Ivy League needs your position. Yeah. And you got the grades. Yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. What's your ultimate goal in coaching? Like, what what do you want to ideally do one day if you can paint uh, paint that picture? Uh, I want to be the best ever head coach. You know, I don't really care where it is or who it is for, as long as it's a good situation where you know I can make the most of what I have to offer. Um, you know, with the blueprint I have and the amount of work I put in, I genuinely do think I can be one of the best ever to do it. And that's something that I've sat and thought about. And, you know, if I couldn't look myself in the mirror and know this is what I'm capable of doing, I wouldn't even put that in the air. Um, but, you know, I trust myself and, you know, the knowledge I have of the game and I'm going to continue to be someone that's curious and wants to learn and see it from different ways. So now when I have the opportunity to be a head coach, I know how I want to do things, what I do and what I don't want to do, um, the type of players I'm going to need to recruit, the type of culture I want to instill in the program. And there are a lot of things that factor into that. So, you know, that's about it. I love it. Love it. I'm going to be following your career for that. All right, man. I hope so. Um, count on it. We're going to end up with some rapid fire questions here. All right. Easy, quick hitters. Um, what's the best win of your career as a player? Any level. Oh man. What is the best win? Lexington Christian beating Lexington Catholic, or did you guys never do that when you were there? I don't think we ever beat them. So, oh man, that's, that's tough. Do we have any crazy games? I do not remember. Like, did you go to the Final honest. Four during your time at UK? No, we went to the Elite Eight twice. Okay. And we won the SEC tournament twice. Um, oh, what about probably, the, probably. I'm gonna be, I don't remember that even that far back. Or if Sheesh. we had any crazy. I know we had some crazy games, but I don't remember any one that stuck out to me. I would probably say the best one is the game we had versus Houston to get into the elite eight when Tyler hit that go ahead three PJ got uh, PJ blocked the shot came down hit a three go ahead bucket to to put us in the lead so I think that was probably one of the crazier games I've been a part of nice what about the best player you ever played against we're gonna do it it's a two-parter so in practice who at Kentucky was the toughest player you have to play against Probably Malik Monk. Okay. And then how about non-Kentucky player, like either at McDuffie or against at UK or against at Detroit Mercy? Played against Bruce Brown, who was – I think he's with the Nets right now. I believe he was in Detroit when I was up there. Um, so I got to know him a little bit. But he was at Vermont Academy when I was at McDuffie. And we played them twice. And he kicked our ass a couple of times. So – um, really good player, really freak athlete, you know, put the ball in a rim. And, you know, I mean, it speaks for him. Now he's in the, in the NBA, he's a pit bull defender. He, you know, he does what he does. And, you know, he's going to stay in the league for a while now doing how, doing what he's doing and how he's doing it. Yeah. And, you know, Tyler Harville was uh, an upperclassman, Lexington Christian, when you were an underclassman. Yeah. He, he went to Vermont Academy and I went to visit him. And that's when Bruce, Tyler was a post grad. And I think Bruce is a sophomore, and he said, yeah, all these high majors are coming in here to see this guy play. And he was in the open gym I saw. I was like, he was all right. I was like, all right, well, whatever. And then, yeah, I saw a couple of Vermont Academy games then when he was a senior, and he yeah. it, it, he, he realized like, He was like a Russell Westbrook type player, yeah. like in high school. And you're like, geez, like freak athlete, good size, like strong body, 
really good with the ball and get to the rim. He's, you know, a hell of a player in high school. Still mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Uh, I, I mean, what genre are we talking? Because if we're talking comedy, I would probably say Step Brothers. Okay. But you can't go wrong with, like, Love and Basketball. That's a great movie. But just two different sides of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Okay. And last thing, what's your hobbies when you're not doing anything basketball-wise? It's really funny. I was just talking with somebody about this the other day. I don't really have any hobbies. It's not good, I know. It's, it's not good for my uh, for my mental. Well, I play like... chess every once in a while, but, oh, you know, okay. I don't really I don't really do too much. I have my dogs that I have to take care of and walk them, you know, make sure they're fed and make sure they're good. It's like having kids almost so yeah i know my dog just came up here was licking me with, uh, earlier during this podcast so i'm sure yours are right outside of camera view yeah, as well no they're sitting right here my one trying to jump up on me in the middle of camera come on relax hey, this isn't 60 minutes minute. here this no, isn't exactly. 60 minutes so we'll be we'll be all right brad anything we did not talk about today that you want to you want to mention no i think we're good i think we covered all the bases so well perfect we are all good we are all well, good well, Brad, thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, if you guys enjoyed this, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can subscribe to the podcast on all major podcasting platforms. Uh, if you want to reach out to me with any questions, I'm at prepathletics.com. You can find me there. And if you guys want to follow Brad's progress, we'll put his contact info and socials in the uh, show notes. But uh, Brad, it's good to see you again, my man. It's been a while. I appreciate you. Yeah, uh, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, good luck this year at LIU Brooklyn. And uh, thanks for joining. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Appreciate you.